London, England. On March the 10th, 1993, a man rang a national newspaper to declare that he'd just killed somebody. The victim, 45-year-old Peter Walker, had been suffocated to death with a plastic bag during a sadomasochistic sex session. He's not just killed his victim, he's humiliated him as well. The killer was 38-year-old Colin Ireland, a man with a singular obsession. He gives himself a New Year's resolution in January 1993 that he will become a serial killer. Determined to get credit for his cold-blooded crimes, he even called and taunted the police. By June the 12th, four more men would be dead across London. Why in particular homosexuals? He kills three men in a week. You know, that's just unbelievable. It just, just it hasn't happened in, in my experience. Colin Ireland had finally attained the attention he craved and became one of the world's most evil killers. London, England, 1993. The capital's gay community was terrified by a spate of killings that had torn through the city. When 39-year-old Colin Ireland confessed to the murder of five men over four months in the spring of 1993, the nation was in shock. The man the press were calling the Gay Slayer had dreamt of becoming a serial killer. And after carrying out his twisted self-prophecy, he gave himself up just as the police were closing in. Former crime correspondent for the independent newspaper, Teddy Kirby, remembers Ireland's brief but brutal killing spree. It all happened in quite an intense period, obviously, in the early part of 1993, and there was this sort of sequence of of murders and the gradual realization that they were connected and police beginning to join the dots. I mean, the part of the problem at the outset was that different murders were being investigated by different teams of detectives and in different parts of London. And then when it became clear as time moved on that the police were looking for a serial killer, obviously there was, there was a huge amount of interest in the story. It was a case that frustrated the Metropolitan Police the investigator who finally gathered the crucial evidence that led to Ireland's conviction was Detective Inspector Albert Patrick. Colin Ireland was a man who was possessed at becoming a serial killer. Ireland was a bit of a curb. He picked uneasy victims. He would play with them. He would uh, tie them up in handcuffs, thinking they were going to have sex, and then suddenly he got a rope around their throat and then strangle them and then release the strangle and say, almost was the effect, well, how are you feeling now? And then eventually pulling the cord to kill him. The pain he must have been going through, a heinous person with me, he was just an evil, bad man. This killer's story begins over 60 years ago. Colin Ireland was born in Dartford, Kent, on the 16th of March, 1954. His mother was just 17 years old. His parents were unmarried teenagers. His father disappeared. His mother struggled. To call it dysfunctional would be to compliment it. Ireland's upbringing was horrible. There is no other word to use. Ireland's mother struggled to settle down, and by the age of 10, he'd changed schools six times. They had also changed home nine times, including a short spell in a homeless shelter for women and children. And then she met a new husband, they had a child together, and they made the decision that it was too hard to raise both these children in the same household. And so he was sent away and put in a home. And the message that gets sent when a parent does that is, you're just baggage. You're not a part of my future. I don't love you. 
I'll dispose of you when and as I see fit. And this is a really crucial time for our development as children. Our relationships with our parents are absolutely fundamental at this point in time. And when you have an interrupted or a disrupted attachment, particularly with your mother, that has a real impact on your ability to form attachments with other people throughout your life. So you've got all of the ingredients for at least a problematic life, but unfortunately, it's not just problematic, it becomes fatal. Constantly on the move, Ireland regularly found himself as the new boy at yet another school. Witnesses that we spoke to told us that he was picked on at school and uh, it was a bit of a loner, really. He was not a popular child at school. He was bullied by others. And when you have that sense of isolation from your peers and that inability to form those relationships, you do really turn in on yourself and you become very insular, very isolated. And your reaction to others' behavior towards you is maladaptive, it's abnormal. So he would react by being violent, he would react by setting fire to things. So there's some real warning signs here of a very, very troubled individual indeed. In 1966, 12-year-old Ireland found himself a summer job in his hometown of Dartford. At one point, he was working in a fairground, and, and a man propositioned him with, with, with gifts if he, if he had sex with him. We can only, with hindsight, say that they, that may well have shaped his, his, his view of gay men. And often, sexual predators will prey on people like him. So they would have picked up on those vulnerabilities. They would have picked up on the fact that he was the odd one out, that he didn't have much of a support network around him, and, and targeted him for these advances. You have, in this petri dish of adolescence, all these things added together, abandoned, mother struggling in poverty, school to school, bullied, an extraordinary conflation of ingredients that might make a serial killer. And slowly but surely, that reality began to emerge. As Ireland grew up, life didn't get any easier. He often found himself on the wrong side of the law. By the time he was in his late 20s, he'd already accumulated a, a, a fairly substantial criminal record. He'd been in and out of prison for things like robbery, theft, deception type offences, and he became interested in survivalism. At the same time, Ireland, who would become obsessed with gay men, seemed to have little trouble in meeting women. In 1981, he met his first wife at a survivalist meeting, and they married the following year. He may well have been gay throughout this period of his life. I think Ireland felt deeply ashamed of his homosexuality and struggled against them throughout most of his adult life. Known by their friends as a gentle giant, Ireland became stepfather to her five-year-old daughter. Not uncommon to see this kind of double life. He got involved with stepchildren and taking care of them. He was a caretaker, he was kind, he was all the things you'd expect from a gentleman. However, five years later, in 1987, Ireland's marriage ended in divorce after he cheated on his wife. He then moved to Devon in the southwest of England, intending to spend time on the moors as a survivalist. Once there, he met a pub landlady in 1989. Three months later, in 1990, they got married. Here was a man, I think, who was living a lie and was angry with himself for living it and was determined, in the end, to take revenge on people who tempted him. Just four months after the wedding, the relationship fell apart. Ireland emptied his wife's bank account and headed to Southend-on-Sea in Essex. By 1991, Ireland had found work there in a homeless shelter, where he went on to become a deputy manager. I mean, in a way, Ireland's failed marriages really mirrored his childhood, and people coming from broken homes do tend to have difficulty forming relationships, and you can certainly see the pattern here. Ever more isolated, 38-year-old Colin Ireland became obsessed with a book about serial killers. 
The inspiration that Colin Ireland talks about for his, his killing, for his murders, he says that, that it's a, a book by a, a former FBI profiler. And Ressler gives quite a lot of details about investigations into serial murder, about the, the way that the, the FBI investigated particular crimes. And I think Colin Island would have spent a lot of time reading about these individuals who inflict harm on others time and time and time again. On January the 1st, 1993, Colin Island made a stunning decision. He gives himself a New Year's resolution in January 1993 that he will become a serial killer. But not just a serial killer, a serial killer of gay men. Earl's Court, London, 1993. Still living in Southend-on-Sea, his hunting grounds were a 45-minute train ride away in West London. The gay community were incredibly stigmatised still at this time, and they weren't as part of the mainstream as they are today. And as such, they become an ideal group of victims for a killer like Colin Ireland. And the timing couldn't be any better for Ireland. His choice of victims, gay men who practised sadomasochism, were already under the scrutiny of the general public and the subject of a controversial police investigation called Operation Spanner. It was a big controversy at the time. It became a big civil liberties, civil rights issue as to whether consensual sexual practices in the privacy of their own homes should be the subject of criminal prosecutions. And it was endlessly debated in the media and the, there were arguments on both sides. And it may well be that that influenced um, uh, Ireland's choice of victims, because obviously men who enjoyed being kind of subjected to pain, being tied up, being bound and gagged, would obviously put themselves in a vulnerable position to someone who wanted to exploit it for violent ends. At the time that, that gay men who engaged in, in sadomasochistic sex were breaking the law. So his choice of victims is absolutely no accident whatsoever. He knows that this group of people are one that the police perhaps don't care about, that society as a whole doesn't care about, and as such, are easier to target and kill. Ireland had studied how to be a serial killer with meticulous precision. He created a murder kit, a rucksack, which he filled with rope and gloves. He was at least forensically aware. The fact that he's carrying gloves with him is indicative of the fact that he knows that, that fingerprints can be traced back to individuals. He's somebody who, who went to great lengths to clean up at the crime scenes where his murders were committed. So he's an individual who, who knows how to cover his tracks and he's got that in mind from the outset. He was not a teenager or a, an aggressive young man of 22. He was a man who had thought out what was going to happen. And what was going to happen was a spree of killings that was to send shivers down the spine of the gay community in London. As well as a type of victim, Ireland had identified a hunting ground, a gay pub in the Earl's Court district of London called the Colherne Arms. He was confident he'd be able to entice his prey. He'd gone from this kind of skinny youth to being quite a burly, well-built, big guy, he was quite tall, a sort of imposing presence. Obviously, in, in that sense, that sort of sadomasochistic thing, he might have appealed to a certain type of man who wanted to be dominated by another man. With everything in place, Ireland was ready to kill for the first time. On the night of March the 8th, 1993, he met his unsuspecting victim. Peter Walker was a 45-year-old theatre director that Ireland met in the Colhoe Arms. They went back to Walker's flat. Peter Walker has two dogs, a Labrador and a German Shepherd. They shut the dogs in the living room and proceed into the bedroom. Peter accepts that sadomasochism is part of the routine that he likes to play, part of the role and therefore allows Ireland to tie him to the bed. And Ireland whipped him and he held a plastic bag over his head and suffocated him. 
with plastic bag asphyxia, you're looking at a situation where it's lack of oxygen that causes you to die rather than lack of blood flow to your brain. And that is a much more prolonged and much more unpleasant feeling. Anyone who's kept their head under a swimming pool for a bit longer than they normally would will know that air hunger, as it's called, that desire to breathe, and knowing that that's not going to be allowed would be a terrible way to die. After killing Peter Walker, Ireland created a bizarre spectacle at the scene. He drapes condoms over his victim's face. He poses two teddy bears in the oral sex position. And this is demeaning to his victim. So he's not just killed his victim, he's humiliated him as well. Uh, and this is something that the island is doing to say, hey, everybody, look at me. This isn't just a murder. This is more than just a murder. And Ireland's cruelty didn't end there. He set fire to his pubic hair. He said later to see what it smelt like. Well, the poor man was already dead. Why humiliate his body anymore? Ireland didn't flee Peter Walker's flat with any urgency. He spent the night there, cleaning up any evidence that he may have left behind before disposing of the murder kit on the morning train back to Southend. He was thrown cuffs in the Thames or out of the train window and disposed of every single murder weapon uh, that he used to kill or strangle them. So clearly evidence that would be on that, his own, DNA, fingerprints, evidence from the bodies are not going to be available to the police to link that item to that killer, to that victim. So it, it makes things more difficult when you're investigating a murder. On March the 10th, two days after killing Peter Walker, Ireland was desperate to announce to the world what he'd done. Ireland's pursuit of his role as a serial killer was sustained when he phoned the son and said, I murdered a man. He didn't say which man, but nevertheless confessed. He also went on to say, well, actually, I'm very worried about the dogs in the flat. So perhaps someone should go round and look after them. The Sun newspaper contacted the police and forensic psychologist Mike Berry. So they rang me up and they said, we've got this weird chap on the phone who says he wants to be a serial killer. And from what they were saying, and by the very nature of it, I, I was quite concerned. Most people don't ring up the police to say they're going to be a serial killer. And then to say, oh, we want the police to go around because of the dog in the house. Earlier that day, when Peter did not show up for work, a concerned colleague went to his home to check on him. When there was no answer, the colleague sought the help of the caretaker, who managed to open his door and found Peter's body and reported it to the police. The grim discovery confirmed that the call to the Sun newspaper was no hoax, and Mike Berry knew that the man on the phone had to be taken seriously. One of the things I did say was not to antagonise him, not to decry or devalue what he's done. When they found the body, they then found the dogs, and they made the mistake of calling him an animal lover, which was a bad mistake. And this is something that, that he doesn't like. He doesn't want to be known as an animal lover. He wants to be known as a serial killer, and a, a sadistic and a cold serial killer. Because of the ongoing Operation Spanner, the police found it very difficult to investigate Peter Walker's murder gay community as a whole were very, very reluctant to come forward and get involved with the police. Because obviously they clearly would have been worried that if they'd in some way acknowledged or admitted involvement in, say, their masochistic practices, they might themselves be, be prosecuted, even if it was nothing to do with, with the case itself. The police didn't know anything about s &M, bondage and stuff like this. They didn't know how to work with the gay community. They didn't understand the elements of the crime and they didn't recognise that they had to see a killer until it was far too late. What was for certain, Mike knew that this murder was not a one-off. It was clearly well-planned and violent, and therefore he was going to do it again. What I couldn't do is predict how quickly he was going to, to kill again. 
It would be over two months before Ireland would strike for a second time, May the 28th, 1993. Christopher Dunn was from London. Again, he was picked up at the Colhern Arms. Again, they went back to his flat. This time, Ireland killed 37-year-old librarian Christopher Dunn, not by suffocation, but by strangulation. Although it can render you unconscious very, very quickly in a small number of seconds, you have to retain that pressure for a number of minutes to kill someone. So it's something you can't usually accidentally do. You have to maintain that pressure and maintain it and maintain it to cause death. It has to be a very deliberate action. And he would toy with the body as well. He would hold the strangulation until his, the face went a, a different colour, then release him. Uh, so he was uh, getting satisfaction and enjoyment out of uh, what he was doing to these, these poor men. Christopher Dunn's body was found two days after his murder by a concerned friend who had visited his home in Wheelstone, North London. The interesting feature about Christopher Dunn was that the pathologist said that he could have died from uh, accidental death as a result of a perverse sexual act, and, and it wasn't treated as a, a murder. Suspicious death, yes, but not a full murder inquiry at that specific time. Ireland picked up the phone once again to tell people about the murder, but this time he cut out the middlemen and went directly to the investigators. And he made this series of phone calls at different points to the police during the course of the investigation. And it was clearly this sort of strong desire for acknowledgement. If he had been the ultimate criminal genius that he was, that he thought he was, of course, he wouldn't have made those calls anyway. But killers, serial killers particularly, wrestle with this internal conflict about, I want people to know what I do, but I don't want to be caught. On June the 4th, 1993, Ireland was back in the Colhern Arms. This time he went home with a 35-year-old American businessman called Penny Bradley III. Unlike the other victims, he was strangled while he was asleep. If you have somebody who's conscious and able to fight back, obviously you will see injuries from a struggle. If you're asleep, you will lose consciousness very, very quickly. And that means that those defensive type marks, the struggle type marks, will not be readily apparent. Ireland had used a rope from his homemade murder kit to strangle Perry. Three days after his murder, the police were called to his apartment in West Kensington by concerned neighbors. The police do not link the killing of a, an American businessman in Kensington with the killing of a librarian or the killing of a director and choreographer. Now, the clear links between the cases here are all of these victims are gay men, all of these victims have engaged in, in sadomasochistic sex, and that should be sending alarm bells ringing, but it doesn't. With three different investigations running across three different policing areas, no link was made between the deaths. The killer himself became frustrated with the police. He wanted the attention, and the police weren't doing their job, as far as he's concerned. I mean, if you're going to be a serial killer, the world's got to know what you're doing. By early June, 39-year-old Colin Ireland had brutally murdered three men in the space of three months. For people like Ireland, who is ubiquitously unspecial, he had to become special in a bizarre way. He had to become special doing something that he was good at. And getting these men to be with him and killing him is what he was good at. On June the 7th, 1993, the same day that police had discovered the body of his third victim, Perry Bradley III, Ireland was on the hunt for another. This time, his victim was 33-year-old Andrew Collier, a warden at a sheltered housing complex in Dalston. Furious at the lack of 
connection with the crimes. Furious at the lack of publicity, Colin Ireland kills for the fourth time. In many respects, Andrew Collier was the most significant of the victims. Um, Ireland had returned to the Colham pub again. Andrew Collier lived in East London. They went back to his flat again. And it was a similar pattern of them engaging in sadomasochistic behavior. And Ireland strangled his victim. He was strangled with a ligature, a noose, and we're now looking at two victims with similar causes of death. And that potentially means you can start linking things together. Once again, concerned neighbours alerted the authorities, and on the 9th of June, two days after he'd been murdered, Andrew Collier's body was found. The case was handed to Detective Albert Patrick, who had no idea what he was about to discover in Andrew Collier's house. I put one foot in the door, looked at this naked body on the bed, uh, a cat dead with a condom on its tail in the victim's mouth and the cat's uh, mouth in the victim with his penis in, and with a condom on the end of it. So most unusual. Something that uh, for me w was a key uh, piece of evidence that, uh, that I wanted to keep as tight as possible because if somebody 10 days later, a month later, a year later said, oh, I killed uh, uh, Andrew Collar, well, tell me about the crime scene. And clearly uh, the cat was, I don't think there's ever, ever been a case uh, in the whole world where a cat has been killed and draped uh, across the body uh, with condoms, uh, as I described. An extraordinarily bizarre act. The body will eventually be discovered in this extraordinary position. If there is any explanation at all, apart from the sheer bestiality of it, is that Ireland was seeking to capture the public imagination. I think he wanted the details to become public knowledge so that people would say, oh, that's the man who killed the cat. After killing Peter Walker three months earlier, Ireland had apparently shown concern for his victim's dogs. But now he'd gone to extremes to show the media that he wasn't the sensitive person they had portrayed him as. That really does get rid of any notion that he's an animal lover. So he's quite pleased that he's managed to dispel this kind of cuddly element to the storytelling around him. Ireland's bizarre display helped the police in their investigation. And this was obviously very similar to the arrangement of condoms and teddy bears uh, on his first victim, Peter Walker, that it allowed the police to link the two cases together. I was aware of a previous murder about three or four months before being dealt with in South London. Uh, and when I started talking to uh, the senior investigating officer, Roe Hemming, for the Walker case uh, and looking at my crime scene, uh, it, there was concerns that we could have the same killer responsible at, at both scenes. There wasn't a system for connecting the dots that we've now become so used to. It was still card indexes and files and connections. It wasn't a matter of technology that now we take for granted. And so it took a long time for those dots to be connected. And for the first time, Ireland had slipped up. The man who'd been so meticulous in the past had left a clue behind at Andrew Collier's home. I was fortunate that I was the only detective to find a, a crucial piece of evidence uh, at the crime scene in the east end of London. It was his fingerprint. At some point in the evening, Ireland handled the window frame, touched the window frame of the flat when he looked out of the window, and he left a fingerprint. With the fingerprint sent off for analysis, the police now knew they were looking for a serial killer. Ireland continued to call the local stations to go detectives. It was the 15th of June, 1993, 2.15 p.m. Call into my incident room and uh, my DC, James Gillen, answered it and started talking to Colin Ireland. He was, he was saying, oh, by the way, I've killed somebody else in Heather Green in South London and put the phone down. So clearly, <laughs> my hair's up here, we are a fifth victim potentially. And then about three hours later, got a call to say that the body had been found in a flat in Heather Green. Ireland had killed his fifth victim on June the 12th, three days before his call to the police. A 41-year-old Maltese chef named Emmanuel Spiteri, whom he strangled in Emmanuel's flat 
in Catford, South East London. Emmanuel Spiteri, again, he'd been to the Colhern. They don't think they spoke, but they sort of eye contact. Emmanuel Spiteri went home. Colin Island followed him, picked him up at the, the tube station and decided to go home to the flat. After forcing Emmanuel Spiteri to give him his cash card and PIN number, Ireland strangled him to death with a rope. This time, the 39-year-old killer tried a new way to hide the evidence. There'd been an attempt to burn the flat. Aye, the furniture had been piled up. He'd clearly set fire to it. Oxygen had run out, and that's why it went out. And very, very fortunately, because it was a top-floor flat, and he could easily have killed people below and, and to the side of it. We know that he's done a lot of reading around cases of serial murder. He's probably got an awareness that fire is one of the few things that will destroy DNA. So I think what's going on here is that he's trying to destroy the evidence that, that links him to the scene. But at the same time, he wants recognition for the crime as well. What he was doing was creating another murder, creating another scene, and, and trying to get recognition, but still maintain that anonymity. Luckily, the fire island had started had gone out and the flat didn't burn down. Three days later, on the 15th of June, Emmanuel Spiteri's landlady found her lodger dead and called the police. They retraced Emmanuel Spiteri's last steps and for the first time got a look at the killer's face. Fortunately, he was captured on CCTV uh, at Charing Cross Station, so we've got Emmanuel, five foot two, in front of uh, Colin Ireland, six foot one, on a single shot just coming out of the tube station. Not very clear of the head, but you can see the build and the height, uh, and clearly you've got Emmanuel in front of him. So that was a crucial piece of evidence. Although, obviously, it was not a piece of evidence which would necessarily confirm that he was the killer, but it was, a, it was that kind of circumstantial evidence on which a case can be built. Armed with the image, the police went on full offensive to try and catch the killer. They managed to blow up the image to get something that was, uh, was a reasonable representation of Ireland. They didn't know what Ireland looked like at the time, but it was something that they could use in publicity to attract attention to the case, to circulate, crucially, amongst the gay community. Myself and uh, Ken John did a midnight press conference because we were concerned that people were being too relaxed about it. Uh, we, we gave a description of who we were looking for and to warn them that they had to be careful because the next one could be you. I think there was a general call out amongst the gay community to be very careful who you go home with tonight kind of thing. There was a great fear, there was great concern. With the police closing in, Colin Ireland decided there was no point in hiding and on the 19th of July, he went to see a solicitor. He decided that I'll, I'll go into the solicitor and he gave an affidavit. He said that, yes, I am the man in the video. Yes, I did go to Emmanuel Spiteri's address. But when I got to the front door, there was another man in the flat. I didn't want to freeze him, so uh, I went home. It was too late to get a train. So I slept in a nearby churchyard. Unbeknownst to Ireland, someone from the solicitor's office passed on his details to the police, who already had his fingerprints on file from previous offences. Eventually, we got Ireland's name, cross-matched it against the mark, and it was his. So that placed Colin Ireland in the crime scene. Uh, and although you can't date a fingerprint, it, it most certainly helped in, in the totality of the evidence. On the 20th of July, 1993, Colin Ireland was arrested. On the 22nd, he was charged with the murder of 33-year-old Andrew Collier. The following day, on the 23rd of July, he was charged with the murder of 41-year-old Emmanuel Spiteri. If Colin Ireland had not been caught when he was, he would have continued to kill relentlessly until he was eventually stopped. It is the classic element of any serial killer. They won't stop until someone stops them. And there was lots of work done. We had ID parades, we had voice ID parades, forensication, and lots of other things. He never opened his mouth for three days. But fortunately, because of the similar fact evidence from the pathologists in the crime scenes, the fingerprint and the CCTV image, the crime prosecutor agreed that we could charge. Islington, North London. 
Ireland had remained tight-lipped throughout his incarceration, but then on August the 19th, just a month from when he was arrested, the killer stunned the police. He said to the warden in the prison, uh, I want to confess. He was remanded back into police custody and taken to Edmonton Police Station where there was a uh, video suite and he he just put his hands up for one of a better. He confessed to all five killings. He did the classic no comment for a while, then he was on remand for nearly a month and then one day he decides to actually cough and tell the police what he's done. I suspect because he wanted the attention. You know, he wasn't getting the attention he needed. This guy clearly wanted to be the film star, the center of serial killing in England. This is a person whose identity was, and sense of self-worth was so frail, so damaged. He was so completely so self-esteemed that he would prefer to be infamous as a killer than be unknown and be a nobody. Detective Inspector Albert Patrick was in the interrogation room and heard the shocking admissions. We sat, the first interview was, OK, you tell us about the five that uh, you've killed. So he talked about very matter of fact. You know, I'm probably 60, 70% quiet. The reasonable human being most of the time. But there's, there is that side of my character that is negative. It's quite cold and calculating. Ireland told investigators about each carefully planned murder in chilling detail. He was just spelling it out as it, it, as it happened. It was horrendous, really. Uh, and, and the pain he must have put through uh, all his victims was just uh, uh, unbelievable. In a couple of cases, he stayed there overnight so as not to attract attention by leaving a property late at night. He got it all organized in a very disciplined and rigorous fashion. And then he admitted in, to the police that he could go on and do more. He said, I felt the process accelerating. I was on this kind of, uh, of this treadmill of crimes and that he was going to keep killing and the, the gap between the crimes would become shorter. On the 22nd of August, 1993, Ireland was charged with the murders of Peter Walker, Christopher Dunn and Perry Bradley III. After the confession, there was no need for a public trial, and for Colin Ireland, bent on infamy, that was a missed opportunity. If you want to be a serial killer, you should have a nice long trial, get all that public recognition, and then they're going to remember you. If they don't know about the case, and most people would, didn't know about the case, again, because it was in a very short time period, it didn't get into the public attention the way it should have done from his point of view. The police didn't have a lot of evidence. They had some evidence. It might have, if it had gone to a jury, he might have just scraped through. The evidence was quite strong, but, but nevertheless, a lot of criminals will say, OK, I'll take my chance. But also they know, and he would know, that the whole case would be examined in detail, raked over by prosecution, the defence and the media. So he would have his kind of moment in the sun. Ireland's hearing was on the 20th of December, 1993. Terry Kirby was in the courtroom. We all turned up at the Old Bailey on the day, and that's the first time, actually, journalists had, had really had, had seen him uh, in the flesh. And I remember these sort of very broad shoulders, and he, he was just sort of looking around like this, around the courtroom, and his kind of head really didn't stop moving all the while. But his face was a bit sort of expressionless. They occasionally got the feeling he was going to sort of break into a smirk. I mean, I rather got the feeling that he was kind of looking around, um, just sort of saying to everybody, are you aware, this is me, I did this, are you aware of this, looking and looking for people's reactions. I mean, that's what he wanted. He wanted that attention. He wanted people to say, 
I'm, you know, you're the guy that did this. At the end of the one-day hearing, Colin Ireland pleaded guilty to all five murders and was given five life sentences, one for each of the men he killed. He was immediately sent to Wakefield Prison. Passing sentence on Ireland, the judge at the Old Bailey said to take one life is an outrage, to take five lives is carnage. I could not agree more. Colin Ireland was narcissistic and psychopathic. No sense of remorse of what he'd done. Even when he was explained to the police, he was victim blaming or he was justifying his behavior by saying they came and talked to him. A man talking to another man doesn't justify you killing them. Uh, but he wasn't mad. He was bad, but not mad. On December the 22nd, 2006, the Home Office changed Ireland's sentence to a whole life term, meaning he would never be released. He died in Wakefield Prison on February the 21st, 2012. He was 57 years old. And I think all the victims and families uh, we'll probably be pleased that that's happened, to be quite honest. Colin Ireland essentially set himself a goal. He set himself an aim in life to become a serial killer. And for me, this really does mark him out as one of the, the most evil serial killers that, that I've ever come across, because his intention was to cause harm to other people. This wasn't a means to an end. It wasn't a way of getting something else. He actually enjoyed hurting others, and he set out to do this. We can have no sympathy for that. There shouldn't be no admiration for a man who set out to be a serial killer. Arnold is a wicked, evil man and treated his victims in the most despicable, depraved way. In May 2007, a report by the independent LGBT advisory group found that a lack of knowledge of the gay scene in London had affected the Metropolitan Police's investigation into the murders. It's tragic that five people had to die before the police and the community changed its behaviour. But we're much more aware of equal rights, we're much more open it in, in many ways, so therefore gay men, gay women, transgendered men, women, they can be themselves more without fear of um, being criticised. They no longer have to be in the closet. The case still affects the detectives who had to sit across the interrogation desk and interview a callous killer. The striking moment was actually seeing Colin Ireland face to face. He was so matter of fact. You know, just different from uh, any any other person I've charged with murder. Uh, he just d didn't show any remorse for what he what he did. He was just uh, just a horrible, horrible, evil man. Being brutally honest, he was just a loner who who, for whatever reason, uh, decided to become a serial killer. Colin Ireland was a selfish killer who took the life of five innocent men just because he decided they deserved to die. His sick New Year's resolution to become a serial murderer makes him stand out as a twisted individual and ensures he'll be remembered as one of the world's most evil killers.